afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Maria Diosa Labiste, and this afternoon I'm going to give a talk on our cyber selves. My talk is really about knowing who we are and our relationship with new media technologies or the social media, and also how this uh, technology would shape ourselves and the information that uh, are derived from that encounter. In the process of interacting with others online, we are exposed to uh, problematic messages and information. And that is what I'm going to discuss today, that despite being so connected with each other, that despite being so well informed, we feel so alone and sometimes misled and fooled by people strangers and even our uh, friends or loved ones uh, online. We have two reasons here for going on. One is connectivity and the other is building a community, right? So I have here some points uh, on how, how uh, do people um, communicate online or why do people go online? The first one is, of course, is the promise of connectivity. We want to connect with people. We want to uh, get to know other people, and we want to reconnect with our friends in the kindergarten or high school or uh, uh, even strangers if we want to network. So um, if you look at, I call them new media technologies. It's basically a, a word, uh, a phrase to describe computers, internet, uh, mobile phones, social media, and the other was is composed of hardware and software because you cannot really separate one from the other. If you think of the mobile phone these days, it's both a computer and at the same time also a platform to, to connect uh, in social media. So the, the promise of connectivity um, is really about giving us more time to, to relax, meaning, in other words, if you don't have anything to do, sometimes you would open your Facebook account and, okay, I have three minutes to spare, maybe I should check my uh, Facebook. And sometimes you would, you would drift to, you know, five or 10 or 15 minutes, that longer time. And we also want to collect friends. We uh, send out friend invites because we want to, uh, if we met someone whom we really like, we might want to connect with the person. And then of course, as you said, you want to connect with your family, you want to connect with your students, you want to connect with your uh, classmates before. And But some people would like really to have a platform where they can broadcast themselves, like they want to be famous, so that's why people um, have to have a really good profile photos and they want to project uh, a certain persona uh, other than themselves. And that is also true why people go online because they want to be popular. They also want to uh, turn their, uh, their presence online into cash. You can actually uh, uh, turn it into uh, money or you can uh, earn uh, as a result. Like if you blog you get, uh, and you're so popular, you get to have adverts and you have to have a lot of clicks and you can monetize it. Okay. So those, that's the promise of connectivity, and those are the activities that would likely be seen as connectivity. But there's also the promise of socialities, um, that's, which is the second question of building community, which is the second answer I mean, of building communities, because we want to build uh, communities, we want to relate to other groups. So when we say the promise of sociality, we refer to the communities that we build and the social groups that we created as a result of going online, like recruit students, like um, uh, present to them our advocacy, like climate change, like LGBT rights, or um, LUMAD, um, the struggle of the LUMAD people. Okay, and in other words, from our very private selves, which is why we build our accounts, we go out and build a public self. Because we want to be in the public sphere, we want to be in the space where people come together and discuss issues that are of interest to them, if you're familiar with Jorgen Habermas' theory of the public sphere. And we also would like to uh, be a part of a larger group uh, or larger groups that share common interests alongside politics, alongside fashion, alongside health, uh, faith, uh, religion, shopping, or travels, or film. If you're a film buff or you're a, um, you have certain hobbies which you, you want to share with others. And of course, 
in the, the promise of sociality is something like we build communities, you know, how communities, people in, the, in a particular community take care of each other. That's basically the concept of uh, community, meaning uh, the, the, the common word there, or the, the um, word is commune, right? When you build community, you, you have this group of people and you want to take care of each other, you, uh, as in um, sharing common interests and looking out for other members of the community. And in other words, through our interaction with other people, we transform ourselves, not just our consciousness, which sometimes, uh, okay, I was pro Duterte before and I really felt sorry, I voted for him and I want to, you know, uh, now uh, feel sorry and wanted to join the protest against Duterte. That's a possibility. And they also want to transform this and others. You become other than what you are. You become a better person, like when you talk to people who share the same hobbies or the same political views, you might be able to uh, glean or learn from them too. If you might be familiar with this French uh, political or cultural theorist by the name of Michel Foucault. If you're in psychology, I think uh, you're, uh, you're familiar with, with Foucault and his, uh, he, in his, his posthumous book uh, is entitled Technologies of the Self. This was uh, published in 1988. This is the last lecture he made in, in the US. And he defined technologies of the self uh, basically as technologies that make us uh, effect change by the help of others or uh, the help of basically our, the help of others and, the, and basically our own uh, decision to effect change on our bodies, in other words, improve our, our physical selves, soul, in other words, our, uh, our consciousness, thoughts, conduct, and the way we think of ourselves as human beings. And then we want to transform ourselves to become happy, to become pure, to become wise, to become perfect or immortal. Michel Foucault was saying is that the technologies of the selves are the things that we do to our bodies and the things that we do to our minds, minds, the things that we do to our thoughts. And because we want to be better, we want to be perfect, we want to be wise. For what? Because that is what we want others to look at us. It's not because um, we just want to feel happy and okay, I continue to exist and not uh, because I, I have a new wardrobe, but you also want to earn compliments from others. So yung ganda ganda ng damit mo, something like that. Or it's really expensive, I saw that in expensive malls or something. And it makes you feel uh, happy, proud, and uh, something like you feel good about it. And that is what Michel Foucault was saying, technology is in the self. So what Michel Foucault was saying is that it is this decision of the individual to change himself or herself and using all the technologies available, be it beauty, be it uh, communication technology, be it health. Like why do you have, why some people have stem cell therapies? I mean, why do people have, uh, uh, why do people go to gyms? to, you know, uh, like a workout at the gym. Why do people do that? Why do they, they want to have abs or biceps? That's part of changing who you are. And that is for Michel Foucault, that is technologies, um, those the forms of technologies of the cell. Uh, that's on the level of the individual, but there are theorists uh, who said that actually, technologies of the cell got to do with identity. I uh, already said that, that because people want to, uh, to construct a self that they want to have. Because of course, uh, selves are not biological entities. I mean, it's something like the sun rises in the east or sets in the west. It's not something natural or biological. It's something which is constructed, something that you create uh, as a result of, your in of interacting with others. So for Sigmund Bauman, he's a philosopher, um, he passed away uh, a few years ago, but he said that identity is something which is actually a complex process and it could not be constructed by biology. 
because this uh, society constructs identity. And uh, but the thing with Sigmund Bauman, because actually he's a philosopher of modernity, is that in that in times or in conditions where there's so much to choose from, you want to be famous, you want to be cool, you want to be uh, this or that, and you want to be uh, techno savvy. You seem to have uh, a lot to choose from. It is as if um, you have a lot of things to choose from, and you can be several persons you want to be. You want, you want to be known as a cool aunt. You want to be known as a uh, compassionate uh, colleague. Or you want to be known as a romantic lover. So there are many alternatives to choose from. And because there's a lot of that, that has been offered to us by the media. If you look at, for example, advertisements in the billboards from one end of EDSA to another, it is as if all our dreams, hopes, and desires were already on those billboards, right? Abs you like, okay. Uh, you want to be uh, famous, it's there. You want to be uh, uh, popular, it's already there. I mean, all sorts of products are calling us out to, to try them out because uh, it, would, it would promise us fame, uh, desirability, uh, romance, like a new shampoo would give you romance, for example, or a new toothpaste would give you million dollar smiles or something. And if people are facing some sort of personal crisis, they are more vulnerable to this so-called pull of forces, pull of uh, identity forming forces. And sometimes this is uh, this condition is uh, all so confusing. In other words, sometimes people, okay, I don't care. I don't care if I dress this way. I don't care if I, I'm not famous. I don't care if not, I'm not the most uh, popular guy or girl in the campus. But there are people who desire to be otherwise. So that's why they become vulnerable to all sorts of messages. These messages are the identity forming messages. And not all of, the, all of them are good messages. Some of them could be problematic. I'm going to discuss uh, a bit of that later. But what the philosopher Bauman was saying is that there is a lot to choose from. And in the, past, in the time of liquid modernity, he said that this idea that everything seems to be fluid, even love could be fluid, uh, even jobs could be fluid. You can dart in and out of certain jobs. But these days, because of endo, because of so much opportunities to choose from, people are darting in and out of certain uh, jobs. Here is a Sherry Turkle, is a um, uh, popular theorist on the positive aspects of the internet. But that's not really true because she also signals the downside of going online. And I think uh, her work later on um, she's, I think, into uh, social psychology, and uh, if you're familiar with her, uh, she has written several books on um, how people interact with screens, how people interact with the internet, and what are, uh, why is it that they feel so alone despite having so much Facebook friends, and why is it that they feel so uh, isolated despite being connected with so many uh, thousands of friends online. She was talking about digital technologies of the self. Remember, um, Michelle Foucault was saying that technologies of the self. So Turkle tried to transpose uh, the arguments of Foucault. And she was saying that, well, this uh, theory could also be used to describe the way in which uh, social media or internet users access uh, or involve themselves or engage in online interaction. Um, and she was referring to the digital technologies of the self. In other words, here, uh, it's the way that we transform ourselves is mediated by technology. So it's no longer doing something on yourself, but seeing yourself as a medium by which technology could affect that transformation. And that's what she was really saying. It's a little push on the theory of Michel Foucault. So, and she was saying that, that the digital technology itself, you think of computers, internet, social media, uh, podcasting, uh, and uh, chat apps, for example, 
you, they allow us to explore and invent multiple selves. Because remember that you may, you maybe have Facebook communities, right? Uh, communities for kindergarten friends, communities for fraternities or sororities, communities for uh, church uh, involvement or student welfare, etc. And each of those communities, we try to project a bit of ourselves, which is might be different from the way that we uh, think of ourselves if we deal with communities formed by uh, families like clans, for example, if you're setting up a Facebook page for your, re for your reunion. In other words, the way that we create ourselves really depends on the audience that we have. The audiences also transforms us, uh, transform, transform, I'm sorry, in the same way that we transform them by our interaction with them. And when we uh, deal with them, we also invent multiple selves. As we said, the communities are really groups of people where they promise to take care of each other, right? You build communities because you share common interests and you build communities because you look out for persons in the community. So these communities would allow for multiple encounters, right? Uh, simultaneously, maybe you're chatting with this group and at the same time chatting with that group and then the interactions could be simultaneous. Because they promise affection, right? And conversation, and also because you also want to invent yourself. Like, if you think it's cool to be with a debating club, so maybe that's what you want to pursue. If you feel that it's cool to be with the groups that uh, advocate for the self-determination of the LUMAD, and you think it's cool, so you might want to, to join the group. In other words, there's always a promise of a new start by creating groups. And I think, I think, uh, that's also true with relationships online, right? Uh, you create communities, you create relationships, and they're sometimes always uh, after uh, realizing that maybe I need more uh, interactions with others and I need more uh, conversations with like-minded people. So maybe that's a little background. Um, balik tayo, let's return to the uh, statistics in the Philippines, we would like to, to see how it is in the Philippines and why is it that Facebook uh, is so popular in this country. And uh, for, for, for many years, we are in the center of uh, uh, internet interaction where Facebook is the dominant social media platform. So I got this from We Are Social, uh, which is a, a group which looks at internet uh, penetration and uh, users all over the world, but we have this one for the Philippines. We have 60, 67 million internet users and are popul on, out of the total population of 105 million. And we also have the same number of Facebook users, 67 million. I think our, us our usage for or the number of users for mobile phones is even higher, like 100 plus million. So in other words, each, each of us might be owning one or two or three phones. And uh, that's why it's double than the um, number of internet users. And it's this, it's many foreigners are fascinated by the fact that Filipinos spend so much time online, especially in Facebook. And when I, first, I, I've, I once joined a conference and somebody from Europe asked me, um, what is the average amount of time that Filipinos spend on social media or Facebook? And I said, four hours at least. I said, wow. And they could, he could not believe it. And I said, well, I, some people would even sp spend, at, would even go online for at least eight to nine hours. I, I have students who say they're, they're online for at least 10 hours a day. Right? There's a lot of time and you just wonder, how, what do they do online? Why do, why do they always have to be online? But three to four hours is a lot of time. For some other countries, it would just be one or two hours. It just even be one hour in some countries. In Europe, for example, it wouldn't even come close to two hours. But in the Philippines, we have uh, almost four hours a day. So if you have 24 hours of time and uh, half of that would be sleeping, so half of the time that you're awake is Facebook time, right? And that's a lot of time. What about reading a book? 
<laughs> what about reading ni Joaquin? <laughs> what about reading hard copies of newspapers, right? We don't do that anymore, but it's amazing that how uh, media technologies transform our reading habits. New media technologies present us the way or uh, conditions so where we can express ourselves. It's true, like when you build Facebook communities, it's really about conversations, it's really about sharing interests or ideas. We already said this, uh, support communities of causes. It's too noisy in Facebook. Yeah. So I stopped using Facebook. I switched to Twitter. I migrated to Twitter because I, I, I will have a way of verifying uh, sites online uh, in Twitter. In the Facebook sometimes, when everything goes into your news feeds, there seems to be an equivalence between fake news and uh, real news. But in, in, uh, and they, because they appear to be just news, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, issues on uh, verification on Facebook, so that's why I switched to Twitter. But of course, trolls are now attacking Twitters, but not so much as Facebook. But Twitter, actually, you can have conversations there. And uh, you can react to news, you can react to events in real time, and it's, some conversations are quite open and rational and engaging. But of course, you can also do that in Facebook, except that if your account is public, there's always a chance that you get trolled. And of course, it, social media presents us a chance to, to become um, a broadcaster, generally, but also a debater, an influencer, an interlocutor, or somebody who could influence other people's views. And I think uh, that's true also in Facebook, except that uh, there are people who are not really that uh, rational in, in uh, offering you discourse. They would say, okay, you're biased, you're yellow, you're uh, pro this, anti that, and that's the end of conversation. And then, of course, what, what you do is just, just leave the, the thread, right? And go somewhere else and maybe block the person because there's no more rational or uh, intelligent conversation that could happen. But what social media offers us is this the chance to, prove, to have a new interpretation of issue or event. Because once a, uh, an event is breaking, and sometimes uh, information is not really that clear enough, people would contribute. There are people who would say, OK, this is really what happened. Um, actually, I witnessed this. They would post a video. They would post a, uh, um, a tweet. It would post a uh, photograph, etc. In other words, uh, we, our, our views could be changed by just uh, engaging with uh, social media. Okay. But an aspect about social media is also about empowerment. In other words, our engagement with others in social media offers us a chance to, to be empowered. By empowerment, I mean the capacity to decide and act on the things that we believe in. Empowerment, I think, is a sort of agency. Uh, some sociologists would say it's agency because there's the capacity to think and act on certain things and to decide what you think is right and to decide on um, what to believe in or to say that, well, that's false news, that's fake news, and this is not really what's true. And empowerment also um, gives us a chance to tell stories of ourselves. In other words, before, probably, uh, if you're a feminist and you are part of a Facebook community which uh, banners women's issue, you connect with a group because you get updates, uh, you get uh, to read art, um, feminist or gender articles, and uh, you could also react to events. Remember the hashtag babayako? which is also the equivalent of the Me Too uh, movement. These are groups, examples of groups that work for empowerment of women or people. 
there's also the LGBT Remember, the Pride March, which drew 25, at least 25,000 um, people in Marikina. It's also a form of empowerment. In other words, asserting the rights of the LGBT. And um, we tell stories of ourselves, and we tell stories about what we believe in, and that is a form of empowerment. And also, by going online, we read or interacted with, or interact with stories. And these stories could form part of our lives. And I think uh, the past uh, few days, you've seen uh, this dispersal photo of the Nutri-Asia strike, where a woman, uh, is, she's actually old, and she, she was blooded, and she was hit by the, the, uh, the, the, the group that dispersed the workers' strike. In other words, um, that gave us a thing that really say, what's going on? Why do, why, why do people are, why do these guards, the policemen are hitting strikers? What is going on? What is uh, the cause that the workers are fighting for? In other words, these are the issues that might uh, arouse our curiosity. And these, the stories that we read could also be part of our lives. Like, okay, maybe I should boycott Notre Asia. I won't buy Mang Tomas. I won't buy as a result of seeing the, the carnage, as a result of seeing the bloody pictures. I cannot even uh, look at it for, for a long time, and I have to, I have to uh, just let it pass because it's so brutal and violent for me. So, but this interaction could be conscious. In other words, it might be something we think about. It could also be nonverbal. And they mark the way in which we know ourselves. Like the how, at what point did we realize that workers should be recognized uh, for their rights, uh, for their fight for, the, for a regular job. So th those are the information which could help us shape our beliefs and the way we look at the world.